Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the special learning session with Vival and the Ateneo de Manila University Press. Our discussion for today is titled, QC Stories, Voices of the Unheard in the Nation's Former Capital City. Before we begin, please take note of the following reminders. Make sure you are registered to the webinar to have your e-certificate of participation. Visit certificate .vivalgroup.com to generate your proof of attendance. And now to proceed with our webinar this afternoon, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our distinguished speaker for today. Michael D. Pante is associate is assistant professor at the Department of History at Atenea de Manila University and associate editor of the journal Philippine Studies, Historical and Ethnographic Viewpoints. Ladies and gentlemen, our speaker for today, Michael D. Pante. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, or should I say good already good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you for uh, taking time to attend uh, this webinar. I would like to share uh, a few stories that I have collected regarding the history of Quezon City, the city, uh, my birthplace, the city where I currently live in, the city where I teach. I teach at the Ateneo de Manila University. And uh, after collecting all these stories, I, I was able to publish a book with the Ateneo de Manila University Press and Kyoto University Press. So uh, in the next few minutes, I would like to uh, share a few of these stories. So if you would... Uh, Please uh, join me, just sharing my presentation there. So the title of my presentation is QC Stories, Voices of the Unheard in the Nation's Former Capital City. And I, I chose the subtitle Voices of the, of the Unheard precisely because I wanted to highlight some of those stories that are not so familiar even amongst Quezon City residents. Because usually, when we talk about Quezon City, and here I have a map of uh, Quezon City in relation to Metro Manila and the other constituent parts of the National Capital Region, we often talk about the grandiose architecture. So we usually find uh, stories about the Quezon Memorial Circle or the Quezon Memorial Shrine uh, and the story behind the person, uh, Manuel Quezon, the founder of the city, or we talk about the EDSA Shrine, uh, the Arlido of EDSA, or the huge buildings that now define uh, the city's uh, landscape, as well as the universities and important institutions that are found in the city. However, there are other stories that have been, should we say, submerged under all these uh, stories of fame, of glory, uh, of, uh, of expansion, Unfortunately, many of these stories are, are significant in themselves, yet rarely talked about. And so I will try to connect all those things in relation to Quezon City's history. Just a quick, uh, a quick recap of uh, Quezon City's history. And uh, there are three important uh, items that I would like to tackle for this webinar. One is uh, the women of the city, uh, especially in its uh, uh, most in its uh, not so distant history, as well as some of the voiceless actors, and I put there, I put actors there in quotation marks because they're they're not actual human beings. Uh, later on, I will try to uh, expound on that, as well as people whose lives are always at the margins. So this would be our uh, quick outline for this brief uh, presentation on Quezon City. So I think we're all familiar with Quezon City's history uh, as well as its status as a former national capital. Probably there are some of you there who are aware or probably were able to live at the time when Quezon City was the actual national capital of the country, not Manila. Okay, For During the colonial period, Spanish colonial period, American colonial period, even the Japanese colonial period, uh, and today... Manila was the undisputed capital city. But for a brief period in time, uh, specifically, specifically from 1948, 
after the war, up until 1976, the actual capital was Quezon City. And uh, unfortunately, not a lot of people know uh, the, the reasons behind uh, the, the creation of Quezon City as a built capital city. It was purposely built uh, to, be, to become the showcase of the nation. Although we won't talk about that anymore because it's a long-winded story. What I would rather focus on are the stories uh, of the unheard uh, among, Quezon City, uh, among Quezon City's constituents. Because in, in many textbooks and in many books written about Quezon City, what is often highlighted about Quezon City's past is its stature as a glorious political symbol, the showcase of the nation. Because that's what capital cities are all about. Like, for example, in the U.S., you have Washington, D.C., so you, you have all these great architectural uh, works, uh, as well as in other European capitals, in Rome, in London. And so it's not uh, surprising to see that in many books devoted to Quezon City, uh, the, the glorious structures and the glorious stories of glorious people are the ones being uh, put there front and center. But there are a lot of other stakeholders in the city that we need to give space to. And who are these people? Uh, in, in some cases, yeah, I mean, there are revolutionary angles to, to look at, uh, given the fact that in Quezon City, uh, we, we have had a lot of uh, revolutionary battles, uh, skirmishes. You have uh, the Battle of, uh, of Pasong Tamo and in the, during the early period, during the early years of the Spanish uh, of, the, of the revolution against the Spaniards. You have the cry of Pugaglawin or, or the cry of Balintawak, whichever version you want to believe in. Uh, all these things happened in Quezon City. But these moments of historical importance happened at a time when Quezon City was not yet Quezon City as we know it today because Quezon City was only created in 1939. Okay? The revolution against Spain happened in 1896. These parts of Quezon City that are part of revolutionary lore, Pugadlawin, Balintawa, Pasong Tamo, during that time, they were still under the city or actually the town of Kaloocan. So what about those stories that happened when Quezon City was already an existing city? Well, we, we try to backtrack a little bit and look at some of those uh, some of those unheard stories. And I want to focus on two particular, should I say, groups of women. And, and again, I put a quotation mark there. Uh, cabaret dancers, for one, uh, and a not-so-human uh, character here in our story, the white lady of Ballet de Drive, probably familiar to many of our, to many of the members of the audience. Now, who were the cabaret dancers? Cabaret dancers were the bailarinas. Who are these bailarinas? They were, well, uh, as, as, as you may have guessed, uh, they were dancers, literal dancers in cabarets, which were created, especially during the American colonial period, to serve as leisure places for men. So men who wanted to spend time, uh, unwind, many of them went to these cabarets in the, in the, especially in the early 1900s, 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, and they would pay uh, for the services of a bailarina, of a cabaret dancer, uh, and that would allow that client to dance with the bailarina for a certain uh, amount of time. Uh, however, that kind of situation uh, led the way uh, led the way to uh, to the creation of certain illicit transactions uh, that happened underneath uh, all, all, all these things. So, so at the background, there were some prostitution happening, and so there were people, especially the moral guardians of society, who didn't look uh, kindly towards these cabarets. And uh, as you all know, many of our previous politicians, they were kind of moralistic about these things. Uh, and cabarets were banned during the American colonial period, banned in within the boundaries of Manila, the capital city. They, they didn't want Manila as the capital city to be, quote unquote, infested with all these cabarets. And still, despite that, many 
patrons uh, wanted the services of these ballerinas. And so in, in this kind of uh, situation, what you have is an uneasy geographical relationship between cabarets and the city of Manila. The patrons were based in Manila, but Manila as a political entity didn't want these cabarets. And so what happens next? Many of these cabarets began to populate the areas surrounding Manila. So you have in neighboring towns like in Caloocan, in San Juan del Monte, in Makati. The, the photo I showed you earlier, it shows there, it says there, Santa Ana Cabaret Manila, but that's actually a misnomer because in reality, Santa Ana Cabaret was found not within the borders of Manila because it, it was illegal inside uh, the territory of Manila. Rather, it was found just outside Manila. In the, board, in the border area, which is within the territory of Makati, not Manila. And so all these areas surrounding the territory of Manila, it became populated with lots of, uh, lots of cabarets. Now, what is the relation between that and Quezon City? Well, when Quezon City was founded in 1939, it was created in the area just outside Manila. So in effect, what happened when Quezon City's territories were being demarcated in 1939, a lot of these cabarets eventually, well, found their way within the borders of Quezon City. And so I show you here some of those, uh, some of those uh, identified cabarets. The letters there and the dots represent a particular cabaret uh, in, uh, in the late 1930s. And you'll find there just... Do, in those in the corridor separating Manila and Quezon City, lots of cabarets. And this kind of situation alarmed many uh, many residents, especially parents of students of UP. Because I think you are some of you here are familiar with this story. It was also during this time uh, in the late 1930s, simultaneous with the creation of Quezon City, was that planned transfer of UP's campus from its original Ermita campus to Diliman in Quezon City. And when they found out that that area in Quezon City just near Manila was populated by all these cabarets, and you, you have these uh, freshman students from UP, uh, you have this alarmist and moralist tendency among these parents to be, oh my God, what's, what's, what's going to happen to our, to our sons? They would be influence uh ba, ba, and they would be uh, uh, uh they, they, they would be uh, they, they would succumb to the temptations of these uh, cabaret dancers so you have you have these kinds of uh, editorial cartoons uh, that were uh, that were published in newspapers at that time and so uh, this moralist kind of tendency appeared in in, in publications you have here in this editorial uh, trying to alarm fellow fellow parents that when you have 15,000 families and 6,000 6, college students move in, how many cabarets will there be in Marikina, which is near Diliman, uh, present-day UP Diliman? Only three kilometers as a college boy, college boy scoop runs from university town. And will Marikina cabarets be able to afford to open only over weekends? That's on one cabaret is only six kilometers away, diba? And there's, that's no farther than the Coloocan cabarets and from the present UP campus in Ermita, uh, Manila. And then the proposed UP campus in Diliman, only two kilometers away from Camp Murphy, present-day Camp Aguinaldo, where there are a lot of dashing army men to make the co-ed's heart go pit a pat. Uh, and you have there a lot of other concerns regarding what's going to happen with these cabarets. No. Uh, so that, that's, another, what's, that's one part of uh, Quezon City's history that's rarely talked about. And I think you, you, you get a sense of why people don't really uh, get to talk about these things because it's a rather not so nice aspect, not so nice dimension of Quezon City's early history. But we, we do have to talk about it because it's, it's, it's part of, uh, of, the, of, the cities, of the city's past. Another important reminder of the city's past is the White Lady of Balete Drive. I mean, uh, I think some of us here are familiar with the, with the urban legend about uh, this white lady uh, who is, according to stories, 
uh, people on haunting that uh, street there in, in New Manila. Uh, some people are saying that uh, she is uh, known to haunt taxi drivers. Uh, she's known to appear to people who are driving along Balete Drive out of nowhere, causing them, uh, causing these drivers to uh, to uh, to, uh, to, to, to to have act to have road accidents uh, during during uh, during the white lady's appearance, and uh, it's part of Quezon City's lore, and not just because of the fact that the white lady story happens in Balen in uh, at, at, on Balete Drive, but the fact that it's a nice symbol of that overlapping of urban and rural uh, in the history of Quezon City. I think, uh, as, you, as, as you can see, although now, nowadays it's, it's no longer very visible due to the rapid urbanization of the city, but when Quezon City was created, it had this atmosphere of being urban and rural at the same time. Manila was the urban core and surrounding it was the countryside, but Quezon City served as that buffer zone, as that in-between area between uh, urbanity and rurality. And Balete Drive kind of symbolized that kind of in-betweenness uh, of urban and rural. Uh, and why was that so? Well, one, uh, you, you can look at uh, the, the, the mere fact that the story was conveyed through uh, oral history, through folklore. We get to consider it as folklore. Uh, and uh, during, 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 our, during uh, uh, the, the times when people were still living in rural conditions, it was through oral tradition that stories like this were, were passed from one, from one person to another. But at the same time, it's not just rural folklore. It had a an urban dimension to it. The, the story usually goes like there's a taxi driver there, which is uh, an indicator of uh, urbanity. It happened in New Manila, an upscale subdivision just outside uh, there, uh, just outside the borders of Manila, uh, and so on and so forth. So you have this nice mix of uh, of urban elements and rural elements making the White Lady of Ballet Drive a kind of fitting, although weird, symbol of Quezon City's early history. So that's also, that's also a, another symbol, another story of Quezon City that we, we don't rarely associate the city with precisely because of uh, the gore and the horror associated with White Ladies. Now, what about other actors? And here I look at quote-unquote voiceless actors. And they are voiceless precisely because they are not human actors. They are not uh, the men and women who comprise the city, but rather they are uh, inanimate objects. The surroundings itself, the surroundings of the city itself that define the story of the city. And I want to focus on uh, the geography of Quezon City uh, as a city of water. And this is kind of timely given what we have experienced Last week, Typhoon Ulysses and all those disasters that we have uh, experienced uh, the, these past few years, we have to look at Quezon City uh, as a kind of uh, hydrographical center of, of the metropolis. One of the chief reasons why Quezon City was chosen as the capital uh, for, uh, for the post-war period was because of its hydrographic features. And you have there... Uh, the map of the Metropolitan Water District, which would eventually become uh, MWSS as we know it. Uh, the reason why Quezon City is so important to the metropolis, it houses the Novaliches Dam or the Novaliches Watershed, which for a very long time served as the main source of potable water for the city of Manila. But because during the post-war period, Manila was already bursting as at its seams and the surrounding cities, Makati, uh, Mandaluyong, Caloocan, are already straining uh, the, 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 the water sources, water supply at that time. More, uh, more, more dams were needed. Hence, you have Angat Dam being identified there at the top of the map. Uh, and the, the, the focal point of this water system would be, uh, would be Quezon City. So you have the Balara filters being opened uh, in the city. Uh, but before that, 
the city was also chosen because of its elevation. Uh, here you have an ad for San Juan Heights. And during the 1920s, 1930s, real estate developers, subdivision owners were presenting their properties in terms of being impermeable to floods. Because even during that time, floods were already a concern. It's not just in the during and uh, in today's time when people keep on thinking about floods and the properties where where they would be establishing their their uh, their residences. Even during the American colonial period, floods were already a main concern for uh, for property owners or would be property owners. And so, real estate developers tried to package their uh, properties along those lines. Uh, and then Quezon City would not be left out of this trend. Right? So you have uh, people creating these imageries of uh, subdivisions being elevated. Right? That's why a lot, of, a lot of the subdivisions, even up to now, highlight that word heights in their, in their name. Santa Mesa Heights, for example, in this particular advertisement. And it's not just uh, it's not just because of uh, this sense of figurative being at a higher level, socioeconomic level, but actually literal heights. Uh, people didn't want their, their houses, their newly bought houses, to be inundated by the constant floods that plagued the metropolis. And Quezon City was a hub of all these real estate developments in the pre-World War II period as well as in the post-World War II period. Uh, here's a map of Quezon City, once again, uh, when it was first created in 1939. Uh, and then uh, in the post-war period, you'll see a lot of developments that are connected to Quezon City's uh, water uh, ge geography of water. You have here a postcard of the Balara filters near Ayala Heights, which back then was a kind of tourist destination. Before people, uh, uh, now, people flock to areas like uh, Cavite or, or, or Batangas or Sambales to go on, a, a, on a, an excursion, a beach vacation. Uh, during the post -war, early post-war period, Quezon City was the destination to be with the Balarat filters uh, uh, serving as a, a mecca of uh, water-related uh, leisure activities. So these were some of the some of the facets that made Quezon City a viable capital city. As well as, as I've already mentioned, the height of the city as well as the bodies of water that comprise the city. In fact, as mentioned here in a government report, the northern part of the city uh, has been selected as the site of the proposed capital city. At present, it cons consists of Cogon land traversed by the Novaliches and Marikina rivers. Unfortunately, it was also a prolific breeding area for malaria vector species. So there's also a downside to it. Yes, it's the center of water, uh, the supply, uh, the, the focal point of the water, potable water supply chain. But at the same time, because of all these bodies of water, it's also there's also a downside to it with the fact that um, malaria breeding uh, or, or malaria vector species of mosquitoes uh, could infest the city. And there were, in fact, some uh, outbreaks of malaria uh, from 1927 to 1929 in La Mesa, La Mesa Water Dam, Watershed. Uh, and so even the laborers uh, had to endure all these problems when they were constructing the Angat Novaliches water projects of the Metropolitan Water District. And uh, that's another part of uh, Quezon City's history that we also need to talk about uh, right now, so there are certain parts of Quezon City that this still has some trouble getting potable water, notwithstanding the fact that Quezon City is the de facto water capital of the metropolis. And unfortunately, rarely do people talk about this particular aspect of the city's history. The labor force had to be replenished continuously to finish the project because of the constant infestation of uh, of malaria. So that's another dimension of uh, the city. So here's a map of uh, a malaria survey map of Quezon City prepared by the Malaria Control Field Laboratory Unit uh, in October 1948 uh, at the time when Quezon City was declared the capital city. Uh, you, you wouldn't want to create a new capital city to replace Manila 
only for it to be infested with malaria mosquitoes. So all of these experiments had to be done. A survey had to be uh, had to be uh, had to be finished, and uh, treatment uh, had to be uh, had to be conducted for the city to be a viable capital, national capital for the entire for the entire country. And as for the last part of my uh, of my webinar, uh, another unheard actor or set of actors in the city's capital would be the people living at the margins. And why are they unheard? Why are they voiceless? It's mainly because of their socioeconomic status. People are uncomfortable talking about this because, uh, as, I, as I've said, Quezon City was supposed to be the capital city, the showcase of the nation. So it should be about architecture, the huge buildings, the grandiose civic architecture, the, 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 the skyscrapers, and the, the people, the glitchy people be, uh, uh, behind them. Uh, but these buildings, these uh, uh, forms of architecture, they were built precisely because of uh, low-income people giving their labor uh, to create all these, all these projects. And uh, many of these people were informal settlers who decided to stay in the city, mainly because they had nowhere else to go to, or maybe because of certain uh, economic uh, economic uh, uh, economic strategies in order to make themselves near more accessible to areas of of income of job opportunities, uh, such as in North Triangle uh, in the contested arboretum site in the UP Diliman, in Constitution Hills, which is presently known as, uh, as Batasan Hills, these were some of the more important informal settler communities in Quezon City that were also significant in, uh, in, in the past of, uh, of, this once, uh, former, uh, of this once capital city of the nation. And I have here some of the photos of, of those informal, uh, or informal communities uh, in Bago Bantay, for example. Bago Bantay was a prominent uh, resettlement area in the 1950s. In the 1950s, Quezon City was more or less rural. It was like your typical provincia. And Manila was the prototypical urban center. But during the 1950s, there, were, there was already a slum problem in, in Manila. And many of the mayors of Manila wanted to get rid of the slum problem, of the squatter problem in Intramuros, in Tondo. And their uh, their convenient way or rather expedient way of solving the problem was to evict the uh, slums, evict the squatters, and then transfer them to a nearby site. And in the 1950s, that site was Bago Bantay in present day, in present day Quezon City. Uh, and yet people like here, as you can see in the photo, uh, in these photos, they, they, were not, uh, they were not criminals as we would want to depict them in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in caricature-like form, uh, they were also uh, people with, uh, with, with, with decent uh, uh, ambitions, uh, having, uh, having a few laughs, celebrating, uh, celebrating their community. Here you have them celebrating a fiesta, uh, although we should not disregard the fact that they were economically vulnerable. And as a result, you can see here their typical houses, makeshift dwellings and they were vulnerable of course to uh, uh, to, uh, to to the problems of associated with poverty uh, street criminality disasters such as floods diseases and the like so this is Bago Bantay in the 1950s before SM City North EDSA came about uh, but Quezon City would eventually this, despite its rural characteristics in the post-war period, as the decades progressed, 1960s, 1970s, it would even surpass Manila as the capital city for slum dwellers. So it was not just the actual national capital, but even the squatter capital of the city. And you'll, you'll find there, even in places such as in, uh, in the West Triangle or uh, in the East Triangle near the Quezon City Circle, where you find lots of open parks nowadays, uh, even those areas uh, were once populated by informal residents. And many of them came from, and I, I show here a map of the Philippines, many of them come from the provinces. So migrants coming from 
poverty-stricken areas uh, in Luzon, in northern Luzon, in uh, in southern, uh, in central or in uh, eastern Visayas, uh, and they were flocking to Quezon City because of the opportunities, economic opportunities that it offered to these residents. But there's also a political side to it. Because by the time that Ferdinand Marcos came to power in 1965, and just a few years before he declared martial law, uh, these informal settlements would form a crucial role, especially in relation to the history of an important Quezon City institution, and that was UP Diliman. I'm showing here a picture of UP's Quezon Hall because of how it symbolized that kind of con uh, confluence of factors that uh, defined an important period in Quezon City's history. And that was the Diliman Commune of 1971. Uh, this was the time when uh, UP activists, student activists declared that UP would be their own territory, uh, that it would be an autonomous area that, was, uh, in, that would be impenetrable vis-a-vis -vis the, the forces of government, of Marcos, the military, and the police. So they, they barricaded uh, parts of the campus. Uh, but one important dimension that's rarely talked about when it comes to the Liman Commune, aside from student activism, is the fact that many of these student activists were radicalized, not really inside the classroom. They were, they, they were radicalized not really by because of what they hear in the lectures, but because of what they see in their surroundings. And at that time, UP was already surrounded by poverty. UP was already surrounded by a lot of slum areas, including this one. In North Triangle, just near in front of uh, the office of the Ombudsman, along Agham Road, where you find Philippine Science High School. In the 1960s, 1970s, it was already a vibrant uh, urban poor community, uh, specifically in Sitio San Roque. Uh, in North Triangle. And one of those student activists who were uh, radicalized by, by that area was John Kimpo, uh, whose life was featured in uh, the book Subversive Lives. Uh, and according, to, according to, his, uh, to his brother, John was happy visiting all these quarter families near Philippine Science High School, PSHS, in North Triangle. Uh, and these families, they eat out a living, with quarrying blocks, uh, they lived in jerry-built shacks with cast of corrugated sheets for roofing, and Jan wanted to learn about living with the poor in the countryside by spending time with these people. So that was the form of radicalization, ra radicalization for Jan, the activist, not in the lectures, not in books, but because of the kinds of communities he encountered uh, in Quezon City. And according to that quote, this patch of North Triangle, which is now uh, near a mall, near some malls, uh, Jan's Little Isabella, it was Jan's Little Isabella in the city. He described the people as really no different from poor families in the countryside. And North Triangle area was not a, a unique case. There were a lot of other cases, for example, here in Batasan Hills, uh, a lot of student activists, not just in UP, but even in places like Ateneo, uh, many of them were radicalized because of their uh, because of their immersion activities in such areas. And the, the ironic thing here is that Batasan Hills was meant to be a showpiece of the nation's capital. Uh, the, the, the image I show there at the bottom is an artist's depiction of what Batasan Hills or Constitution Hills was meant to display. It was meant to display grandeur. It was meant to be the the, the the, the peak of the city, of the, of the nation as the citadel of democracy. However, because of lack of implementation, because of lack of budgeting, because of the lack of political will uh, as well, rather than have this kind of uh, grandeur political architecture, in reality, what happened was Batasan Hills became a center of informal settlements as we know it today. And rather than be, be serving uh, the nation's politicians, Batasan Hills became a place of radicalization for a lot of student activists. And up until now, you have still have a lot of uh, student activists uh, immersing themselves in these kinds of communities. Now, 
uh, so more or less that's it for uh, for my for my sharing uh, here in uh, uh, in this webinar. I, I hope you'll find the time to uh, you'll find the time to read some of these stories, which you will find in my book, and that is why I am uh, promoting my my work. It's uh, titled a "Capital City at the Margins: Quezon City and Urbanization in 20th Century Philippines," published by Ateneo de Manila University Press. And uh, you'll find other stories of unheard actors. And unheard men and women of the city uh, who are uh, find, fighting for their place in the city. So I, I hope you'll take the time to get a copy. Uh, uh, I have a lot of things to share there uh, in my book. And so uh, to, end my, to end my webinar today, I'd just like to uh, reiterate some of the points I shared. Uh, one is that the need to look at women and their role, the need to look at geography and history, uh, and the importance of the urban poor, because these are some of the aspects of a city's history that are rarely talked about and they are rendered unheard. And so uh, with that, I, I end my presentation. I hope that you were able to get some, uh, some, some insights from it. So thank you very much. And uh, if there are questions, I am here to, I'll be glad to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doc Mike, for sharing these valuable stories with us. Of course, I would like to invite everyone to please get a copy of Doc Mike's book titled Capital City at the Margins, Quezon City and Urbanization in the 20th Century Philippines. You can get a copy at shop.vibaldgroup.com for only 485 pesos. And there we have it on behalf of Vibal Group Incorporated and the Ateneo de Manila University Press. I would like to thank our speaker for today for this insightful and meaningful discussion. It is an honor to have you with us, sir. Don't forget. Yes, Paul. And to all our viewers, thank you for your continuous patronage to our daily learning sessions. Don't forget to register to get your e-certificate of participation. See the link of, of registration at the caption. So again, a pleasant afternoon to all of you. Thank you.